I'm doing something a little different this time. This game comes as a special Patreon request. Yeah, someone actually cared enough about my chicken shit little show that they donated a fairly substantial amount of money to my page. So this video is brought to you by John Dolan. I don't know what to say, thank you so much man. And let me tell you, this game is going to be totally rad. No, I mean, that's what it's called. Totally rad. Released in 1991 for the NES, Totally Rad comes to us from Japanese developer ICOM, creators of the homoerotic plane crash simulator Amagon and online pronunciation debate generator Astyanax. Not that you'd know from looking at it, since Jaleco seems to have taken every opportunity to claim credit for the game, even though they're just the publisher, not the developer. The only way to see the ICOM credits is to input a special code, but what do you expect from a company that thinks their logo is more important than the name of the game you're playing? In Japan, it was called Magic John, but I guess ICOM changed it because they didn't want the game to sound like it was about an enchanted toilet. So, rather infamously, it was lazily rebranded, sprites were redrawn, and we have the game we're taking a look at today. And, well, I sort of knew what to expect going in, but I was still not ready for this. I'm going to read you the first line of the instruction book, and maybe you'll be able to point out just what makes this game so infamous. Thanks for buying Totally Rad from Jaleco, dudes. It's just one of many most excellent and bodacious games we'll be bringing out for your NES. Thanks to the efforts of the localization team, instead of a cliché story of a teenager saving his girlfriend with magical powers, we got the totally not cliché story about a teenager saving his girlfriend with magical powers in CALIFORNIA! CALIFORNIA, WHERE LITERALLY EVERYBODY IS A SURFER! The whole game is filled with this over-the-top surfer lingo that makes it take forever to say the simplest of concepts. Whoa! You found the table of contents, dude! <laughs> it's not that hard, it's right there in the front. The first chapter is called, I Kid You Not, the totally rad story of a most unprecedented regular dude, a very righteous babe, and a gnarly old magician who used to live in a bodacious spread inside the San Andreas Fault. Nice character designs there. One of these things is not like the others. So Jake's just this regular dude, right? And Allison is this very righteous babe, right? And Zebediah is this gnarly old magician who used to live beneath the surface of the earth, right? Yeah, I kind of gather that from the fact that the first chapter is called The Totally Rad Story of a Most Unprecedented Regular Dude, a Very Righteous Babe, and a Gnarly Old Magician Who Used to Live in a Bodacious Spread Inside the San Andreas Fault. Anyway, Zebediah's magic is not your usual totally bogus prestidigitation that only a total bonehead would believe was real. No way! I mean, when's the last time the magician your mom hired for your little sister's birthday party turned himself into an eagle? Well, that one party in 1989... Zebediah can actually do all that radical stuff. So Jake and Allison were impressed to the nth power, and Zebediah felt a special connection to Jake. Kind of a touchy-feely thing without the touching and feeling, you know? Uh... I don't think I want someone who looks like that to get touchy-feely with me. Hello, kids. Would you like to know what the P stands for? Well, one thing leads to another, and before you know it, major boom for sure. Zebediah teaches Jake everything he knows, and Jake changes from a regular dude with marginal skateboarding skills to this really unprecedented regular dude with marginal skateboarding skills who could turn into an eagle, a lion, or a gag some fish thing who can now cause major environmental havoc with his newfound magical powers. So now, Jake is just a whole lot more entertaining at parties, right? Wrong! Little did Jake and Allison know that they had become pubescent pawns in the pestilent power politics of Idoji. Hang on, the big evil bad guy is named Idoji? Idoji doesn't sound like the name of an evil mastermind. It sounds like a pet that hangs around with the mystery-solving Hanna-Barbera team. No, D.O.G., run home! I'm going to school! The malfeasant underground menace through mental malpractice and mesmerism had managed to impose the malevolent meanderings of his morally moribund mind on the majority of the inhabitants of the underground world. This paragraph is brought to you by the letter M. God, that's two Sesame Street references in one page. Whoa, somebody slapped me. Say, I could use a picture break. How about you, dudes? And then suddenly there's just a random picture of a World War II era fighter plane. And keep in mind, this game has nothing to do with planes or World War II. I'm being random. 
And Doji decides that he wants to kidnap Allison's dad, a professor and the smartest guy on the West Coast. Except that Allison's dad lives near the Hollywood Freeway, takes the Hollywood Freeway to work, works near the Hollywood Freeway, and basically hardly ever leaves the Hollywood Freeway. And as it happens, Doji has this major public transportation advocacy thing, and there's no way he'd go anywhere near the Hollywood Freeway. So he kidnaps Allison instead, thinking that Allison's dad will be lured from the Hollywood Freeway long enough to save his daughter. Turns out he was right. So by now you probably got it figured, right dudes? Jake, with a little help from Zebediah, has to rescue Allison and Allison's dad. Only Jake's gonna have to use his totally rad magic to totally wipe up the floor with Hidoji's totally grotesque friends as he makes his way toward Hidoji. I know it's been kind of a long story, but it's so real, you know? Later, dudes. It's stories like this that make me appreciate the subtlety of the president has been kidnapped by ninjas. The entire instruction manual is written like this, and as you'll soon learn, it's all completely pointless. There are parts that seem like they would be useful, like the rundown of all your magical powers. For example, fire eliminates or weakens enemies on screen, and wind eliminates or weakens all enemies on screen. There's a picture of the guy's boss and one of his girlfriend, whom he refers to as a very righteous babe for sure. Righteous babes aside, I think it's time to take a look at the game itself. Are you ready? Because I know I am. Now, the first thing you notice is that the graphics are pretty damn good. There's even parallax trolling in the background, which looks really cool given the limitations of the system. My immediate instincts say the controls remind me of Contra, but with the added ability to charge your shots like Mega Man. Not that this proves to be very useful, however, since you can't hold the charge while jumping, which is surprisingly crippling. If you're holding your shot, you can't dodge enemies, and you also can't attack any enemies in the air, where more than half of them seem to be. So throughout the first stage, you're dealing with kamikaze landmines and manhole covers that shoot missiles at you, as you would find in your average everyday amusement park. After a mini-boss that can only be described as low-rent alien Donkey Kong, you head into the circus to fight evil balloons and flying killer clowns. Who were those dweebs anyway? Hey, where's Allison? Jake, they're like, stealing me or something. Because California! Or we all like, talk like that and stuff. One really annoying thing about this game is that every enemy has a set spawn point, so if you scroll it back on screen after you've killed it, it comes back every time. You can use this to farm for points for extra lives if you're desperate, but I've never found it particularly valuable. There's one part here where you can actually cause massive slowdown by maxing out the sprite limit, which is a little funny, but not especially useful. The first true boss is a giant ear of corn with a mohawk that I'm pretty sure is supposed to be the monster from the game's cover. Her name is Rubilia, and every time you hit her, she shoots out popcorn. Ah, shit. Oh, great, it's one of those games. Yeah, totally rad doesn't fuck around. If you die to a boss, you don't respawn at the boss. You have to play through the last stage all over again, then you get to face it with whatever health you have left. Thankfully, of your 12 magic spells, two of them allow you to restore your health. The half heart refills three hit points and the full heart refills all six, but it costs twice as much magic. This means it is always less beneficial to use the full heart, because if you're ever in a situation where you need to heal six hit points instead of three, you're already dead. Moving on to stage two, you start to realize just how useless the dialogue of this game actually is. Jake, communicate telepathically from now on. It's not like I have a choice. Allison has been kidnapped! Yeah, I gathered that from when she said, Jake, they're like stealing me or something. You've got to save Allison. What do you think I've been doing this whole time? Your magic is more powerful than ever, but be careful. Some magic spells are bogus and won't work. That part is actually a complete lie. Nowhere in this game do you gain new abilities or strengthen your existing ones. In fact, you don't pick up any power-ups whatsoever. No extra lives, no bonus points, no health or magic restoration. Nothing. You start every level with the exact same stats. Six hit points, 12 magic, and the same 12 spells. Four of them, fire, water, wind, and earth, are area of effect that hits everything on screen. And despite them having different animations and apparently different elemental properties, they all do the exact same amount of damage to every enemy. I repeat, exact. Same. Damage. And to top it all off, it's all completely useless. 
I've never found a situation where you are so utterly surrounded by enemies that your magic is worth using as an attack. It is much, much more valuable to use the points to heal yourself when you take damage. As long as you take your time and attack the enemies as they come, you really won't face much hard resistance. The downside, though, is that it turns the levels into a real slog to get through as you have to stop and carefully kill every enemy you come across. Most of the damage you'll take isn't due to the enemies catching you off guard. It's because you got bored and decided it was more worth your time to heal yourself later than to stop and fight them. You have two utility spells as well, one that freezes the enemies in place and one that makes you invincible. But like the attack spells, I've never found a good place where these are worth casting as opposed to just saving it up for healing later. Stage 2 is where things start to get interesting because it's the first point in the game where you're forced to use your transformation spells. You have three, the lion, the eagle, and the fish. The lion has the most powerful attack, but it has a short range and you can't use it in mid-air. When he jumps, he becomes invincible, but he can't do any damage to enemies, so it's purely a defensive maneuver. He is good for getting past these flame columns, though. There's Fish Man, and as his name implies, he's designed for use underwater. He throws out ninja stars and can swim, but besides that, he's really just a weaker version of John, since none of the animal men can charge their shots or cast magic spells, not even healing. Eagle Man is by far the most useful in the game, since he can just fly over everything. It pretty much turns the game into the final level of Kid Icarus as you shoot enemies out of the sky and just say fuck you to all the platforming the developers put in. I kind of feel sorry for the level designers. They put in all this interesting stuff like balloons and spike pits, but then someone in the character design committee thought, hey, what if we let the player turn into something that can fly? So after fighting your way through the city streets and a giant monster with an eye on his ass, you rescue Allison. Like, my dad tried to save me and now they've got him too. No way! He's the gnarliest professor on the coast! Jake, I kind of want my dad back, you know? California! We're kind of gnarly and stuff, you know? That's totally understandable. Wow, how bad if I save him? No, Jake, that's crazy. You would need to have magic or something. In Stage 3, you'll want to use the Fish Man to maneuver in the river. This level introduces underwater treadmills that push you Oh, wait, no, they're spinning spikes. I need to start playing these games before I record commentary. The Fish Man is rather awkward to control, by the way. You can't actively swim downward, you can only float down slowly. That's almost exactly the same way Eagle Man works, just with lower gravity, which is a really lazy way of making the water work differently than the air. So after fighting your way through fish robots and buck-toothed mutants, you eventually face off against Nauticill. Once you turn him into sushi, Zebediah contacts you again. Jake, the people that took Allison's father, they're people from the underground world. They are intelligent, but incredibly ugly. And thus they must be shunned from society and picked last in football. Your magic is more powerful than mine now. I have nothing more to teach you. Again, nothing has changed. Exact same stats as before. Stage 4 throws you into the caves, and this is where the mini-bosses start to get way harder than even the stage bosses. This one in particular is going to confuse everybody. Your attacks do absolutely nothing to him, and shooting the tendril on his head simply causes it to grow back. So tell me, what do you do? Do you A. Try using your magic against him. B. Try hitting him with charged shots. Okay, C. Maybe one of your animal forms could hurt him. No, the answer is D. The answer is fuck you. The answer is you have to keep killing the tentacle on his head until it doesn't grow back anymore. Something we have already established seems to do absolutely nothing. Keep in mind, the game gives you no indication that he only has a limited number of them. So you just have to assume that the tendril will eventually stop respawning, at which point he will start opening up his gaping belly where you can deal damage and eventually kill him. Once he's done with, the stage 4 boss is pretty simple comparatively. Just hover in the corner and shoot him while avoiding his attacks. I think I'm picking up a message from Allison. Jake, I've been practicing magic too. Gnarly, huh? As soon as I figure out how to get unchained from inside this locked trunk, submerged in this tank of water, I'll help you out! How much you want to bet Zebediah is behind that?
Allison, sweetie, come here and let me tie you up. I swear it's for a magic trick. Before we move on to level 5, I just want to say I'm kind of disappointed in what this game actually has to offer. For something called Totally Rad, it's surprisingly tame in terms of overall radness. You'd think they would have gone all out with this, gave the player a skateboard power-up, collect letters that spell out the Hollywood sign for one-ups, fight a fish boss while surfing on a sick wave, get bonus points while doing tricks, but no, beyond the tacked-on branding, the game itself is surprisingly mediocre. Anyway, the final stage contains by far the most annoying and difficult mini-boss in the game. He's this alien fish thing with an ungodly amount of health. Dodging his shots is virtually impossible, and you can only shoot him in the head. If you try a War of Attrition, you will never win, because, like I said, his health is astronomical. I have gotten here with full health and magic and gone through my entire magic meter to keep healing myself and trying to kill him, and still not succeeded. The only way to beat him is to find a pattern to exploit his AI. You don't even want to know how long it took me to figure this out, but stand here, shoot him, and run under him as soon as he jumps. Stand on the other side, shoot him a few more times, and go back. For some reason, you can only hit him in the body when using the fish or bird. Jack's shots won't go through his armor. You have to keep to this pattern for about two minutes without screwing up anything. I counted, it takes about 50 shots to take him down. Thankfully, once he dies, you can go up against a doji himself, one of the most unsubtle and cliché end bosses in video game history. One who can't even spell traitor correctly. Ah, we've been expecting you. You learned a great deal from Zebediah, a traitor who was exiled from our underground empire. Yes, he was once one of us. No matter, whatever you've learned won't be enough to save you. He's an alien creature in a glass dome protected by an armored colossus that carries a sword to protect himself from your shots. Because that's what you use swords for. The key is to shoot him in the face whenever he drops his guard. His first form is a pushover, especially compared to the mini-boss you just faced, because he only takes 12 hits. But his second form... Oh man, you are not ready for this. For his second form... He moves down slightly on screen and does the exact same thing as before! Ah. Uh... For as hard as the rest of Adoji's minions are, if you made it here, the final boss is an absolute cakewalk. Jake! Professor! It's most righteous to see you! Are you the one who saved me? Dude, did you get a blow to the head or something? Of course I saved you! I'm here, aren't I? You know, a simple yes would have sufficed, Jake. Dad! Jake! Dad! Jake! Alright already, Allison. Say, how did you get here anyway? Zeb and I took the Hollywood Freeway. Did I mention this game takes place in California? Allison gives Jake a letter from Zeb that says he left to be with his people. Wait, Zeb wasn't human? But he looks so much like the other characters! And Allison asks if Jake will train her in magic now that Zebediah is gone. Uh, why don't we just stick to skateboarding for now, and leave the lessons to Zeb next time we see him? Copacetic? For sure, dude. And with that, our adventures in early 90s teenage pandering come to a close. Do you ever get the feeling when playing one of these old games that something was lost in the translation from Japanese? Like, there's this whole other story and level of subtext that was cut out due to lack of space? Well, thankfully, by looking at the original Famicom version, we can discover the truth! Well, it does answer a few questions. For one, Jake and Allison, originally named John and Yu, were drawn in an anime style that more fittingly matches the style of Zebediah, who was originally named, wait for it, Pong, hence the P. I don't know why John has wings on his hat, though. Maybe he found the red switch tower. If you compare the artwork side by side, you can see just how little they changed. Here, they didn't even move the monster's shoulder over, despite Allison's hair taking up less space. And of course, keeping the P on Pong's hat the same even after they changed his name. But then they went to the trouble of completely redrawing Jake's running sprite, which only appears once, and yet Zebediah, who appears in almost every cutscene in the game, has this confusing P on his hat the whole time. They wouldn't even have to change it to a Z, they could just get rid of it and the American players would never have to know. Watch, I can do it myself in about one minute. Surprisingly though, the storyline is almost identical to the NES version, just without the painfully unnatural surfer patois. 
John is learning magic from Mr. Pong, Yu is kidnapped, which leads the doji to kidnap her father. It's beat for beat the exact same story. There are a few key differences in the details, though. Yu never says anything about being locked in a box, he just says something like, I'll be there to help you save my father. Yeah, thanks a lot, April. Mr. Pong never says anything about the underground people being ugly, just that they have advanced technology. And it's implied that they were the original inhabitants of Earth before moving underground. But despite the Famicom version telling the exact same story without the blatant pandering to the youth demographic, the NES version is better. The story in both games is barely existent. It's just a skeleton on which to hang the gameplay, which, let's be honest, is mediocre at best. Over half your spells are useless, and the level design leaves a lot to be desired. Many enemies are recycled to the point of frustration, and the platforming is pointless given the ability to fly or swim over most obstacles. This is the very definition of an unfocused game. It gives the player a lot of options, but doesn't know how to properly balance them in terms of game progression or pacing. There is absolutely no sense of growth or increasing in power, despite what Zebediah keeps telling you, and you'll find yourself trying to rush through the levels just because you're getting impatient and bored. There's no exploration or secret areas to unlock, no collectibles like coins or other power-ups, or any reward for trying out different spells. The above-average difficulty does help a little to add some longevity to the game, but there's not much here to make you feel accomplished when you beat it. If it weren't for the utterly baffling localization, nobody would even know or care that this game exists today. And that's the real magic of Totally Rad. It's a game that is so much a product of its time and so dated that it takes something that offered absolutely nothing of value and turned it into a game that's at least worth talking about. In the annals of gaming history, Magic John may be a footnote, but Totally Rad is at least a paragraph. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you again, John, so much for your support, and until next time, everybody, have fun and happy gaming.